Hi, this is Dane Pasty for WatchersOnTheWall.com, here with your weekly brush up of last week's episode entitled Sons of the Harpy. Now, remember, spoilers are at the end for you non book readers. Now, let's get started. In spite of our Dorn tease, we don't really start there. We start with Jorah outside of Volantis somewhere, and he begins the story by knocking out this poor fisherman and stealing his boat. And then we see him taking Tyrion and throwing him like a big sack of potatoes onto the boat. Then we jump from one surreptitious boat journey to another where we see Jamie standing on a boat looking wistfully out at Tarth, which is where Brienne is from. Perhaps he's thinking of Brienne and hoping she's doing well and that she's having some success at finding Sansa. Then we go below decks to find Bronn grilling Jamie about what the hell they're doing. He asks, why us and why in secret? Why you, Mr. One Hand Jamie? Bronn susses the reason out pretty quickly and realizes that it's guilt for his having released Tyrion. And then Bronn says, well, give my regards to your brother. And Jamie says something that really surprised me. He said, the next time I see him, I'm going to basically cut him in two. Just pretty good odds that they'll actually end up seeing each other before the end. Then zoom, we're off to King's Landing and we see Cersei and the ever shrinking small council where Mace is telling Cersei that the Bank of Bravos is calling in their debt and they really can't afford to pay it. Now Cersei has been expecting this request or demand from the Bank of Bravos for a while. She had that talk with Daddy like, what, last season? So she was just waiting for this to happen and she is more than happy to send Mace toddling off overseas. And who gets to accompany her to Bravos? No one less than Sir Marin Trant. And Mace, as usual, is too stupid to see what is actually going on around him. Still in King's Landing, we cut to a meeting between Cersei and the High Sparrow, who looks a whole lot cleaner than he did in the past meeting, so whew, thank goodness for that, huh? Did you notice the note from Littlefinger on the table? Apparently, putting this guy in charge of the church wasn't enough for Cersei. Her power move now involves giving him a fanatical religious army called the Faith Militant. According to the High Sparrow, their job is to defend the bodies and souls of the common people. And then she drops the bomb, the bomb that she's been planning all along, which is that there is a sinner in their midst. And although we know she's targeting Loras, I kind of thought it might have been Littlefinger because of the way they started the scene with the note, but I don't know, maybe she plans to work her way around a little finger. Who knows? So cue the new army of the Zealots. They're running amok in King's Landing, going into pubs and wasting perfectly good alcohol and breaking up other people's gods and idols and interrupting sexual trysts and brothels. In the meantime, the uh, city guard is not doing a damn thing about it. There's a bunch of cutaways in this scene to a guy's forehead getting carved up in the seven-pointed star which is part of the initiation process into the Faith Militant. Back in the brothel, we see Olivar making an appearance and ineffectually trying to stop the raids. And then he really backs off when he sees them killing a, a male noble who was with a male prostitute. Then right after that, they reveal that the man receiving the carving is no less than Lancel, Cersei's uh, eh, 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 cousin. Nothing to worry about there, I'm sure. I'm sure Lancel's just getting a, you know, a nice new tattoo of some sort. And then the scene ends with the Faith Militant busting onto the palace grounds and arresting Loras. Still in King's Landing, we go to Marjorie, who is in a tiff. She busts in on her dear, sweet, clueless boy toy, Toman, while he's getting his grub on. So she tries to reason with him, confronting him, and none of that does any good. He's just clueless. So Marjorie tries her next hack, which is to appeal to his feelings for her. Then Toman runs to Mummy Dearest and stomps his little foot and demands that she lets Loras go. And Cersei smarmily replies that she's not the one holding Loras. Then she did something that really puzzled me. She tells Toman to go talk to the High Sparrow himself. Of course, she knows it won't do any good, and she knows she's sending him on a fool's errand. At first I was shocked because she was putting his life in danger by sending him there. But then I thought about it and I remembered how Cersei really doesn't love anybody. Not really. There's also the aspect that Cersei's trying to punish Toman for his switching allegiance to his wife. 
although he's totally not conscious of that having happened and he's certainly not doing it on purpose to hurt her it's what man naturally does when he gets married the point here is that she's willing to endanger his life to punish him for this and he's really not doing anything wrong except getting in the way of her interests so poor little Toman goes down to the sept and he gets nowhere near the high septon he ends up being too intimidated by the faith militant and all the people hanging around in the square there then off he goes back to the palace to Marjorie to tell her that he got nothing accomplished and Marjorie is not a happy camper, understandably. Marjorie leaves to go say more to her grandmother to come help because if anybody knows how to deal with this shit, she will. And Toman has the nerve to ask Marjorie if she'll be coming back later for his booty call. Yeah, no, that's not gonna happen. Toman, a bit of advice, don't hold your breath, buddy. From the south of Westeros, we fly up to Castle Black, where we see John in the courtyard helping the other guys with their sword play. And we see Stannis and his prune of a wife, Selyse, watching them. Now, Selyse is very scornful of John because he's the child of a tavern slut, according to her. And Stannis says something really interesting. He says, perhaps, but that really wasn't Ned Stark's way. So clearly, he's not buying into the John is Ned's son argument here. And that's huge, people. It's massively huge. They're practically hitting us over the head with it. Anyway, Celise devolves into some self-pity bullshit and starts directing her hate towards her poor daughter, Shireen. And then Melisandre interrupts and does something for the first time that I actually liked. Except the only problem is Melisandre's not doing it for a good reason at all. Melisandre basically tells Celise to shut the fuck up and leave Shireen alone. And the look she gives her is a wink-wink, nudge-nudge kind of look. And it's pretty ominous. Now last season I had some speculation in my videos about Shireen's fate and if you want to know more about my thoughts go to the spoiler section of this video. Then Celise scurries off, literally scurries off like a rat, and Melisandre stays to talk to Stannis and Stannis is basically saying you know I need you to come to Winterfell and she goes yeah you damn right you do. And Stannis asks her what do you need? And Melisandre says, I only need to serve my lord, while she's intently watching John down in the courtyard. And right then it was pretty obvious she was going to make her wah chicka wah wah moves on John this episode. Next, we're in the Lord Commander's office where we see Sam handing John a bunch of letters to sign, pleading for more men from the various northern lords. And one of the letters is to Roose Bolton, and John is really angry. He's like trembling with it almost, and he refuses to sign it. But Sam reasons with John and, you know, tells him you have to put duty before personal feelings and he's right and so John signs a letter. Now this letter reminds me of another letter in the books and if you want to know more about that go to the spoiler section of this video. So John is still upset from the letter and emotionally vulnerable so you just know that's when the Red Witch is going to walk into the room to, to seduce him and of course that's what happens. Did you notice how Kit uses his body language, how he straightens up, he straightens up, uh, straightens up in his chair when Melisandre walks in. Melisandre starts by trying to reason with him to get him to come to Winterfell. But when that doesn't work, well, then it's booby time. And John is clearly tempted, but he manages to fend her off with basically his love for Egret. The only thing I can think of is that she's trying to make another shadow baby with him. In the end, I was proud of John because he was able to resist Melisandre when even somebody as strong as Stannis couldn't. But her parting line about him, you know, Jon Snow, you know nothing, and then her smirk, oh, I was like, what a bitch. Now this next scene is one of my favorite. Still at the wall, Shireen interrupts her father doing some paperwork, and she asks him, is he ashamed of her because she knows her mother is. Stannis does something very touching. He explains how she got grayscale from a doll that he bought her and how he didn't give up on her, how much he loved her and he did everything possible to keep her with him. It was an incredibly sad story, but it really elevated Stannis in my eyes. I couldn't help but think about Cersei and her actions towards her kids. What a big difference that is, you know, like what Cersei is doing isn't love and what Stannis did and is doing is. A little further south in Winterfell, Sansa is in the family crypt lighting candles and it's kind of creepy and of course in a creepy place a creepy guy's gonna be lurking around and Littlefinger's shows up and we get another Rhaegar story apparently Littlefinger was at the great tourney in Harrenhal when Rhaegar gave the winter roses to Lyanna Stark instead of his wife did you know his reaction when Sansa said and Rhaegar kidnapped her and raped her take a look at it really closely 
Yes, he chose her. And then he kidnapped her and raped her. Did you see that? Let's look again. Yes, he chose her. And then he kidnapped her and raped her. There it is. You don't have to speak English to know what that expression means. Clearly, he doesn't think that's the truth. And we have plenty of evidence from other seasons that Rhaegar wasn't necessarily a bad guy. In fact, did we ever hear Ned say the words that Lyanna was kidnapped and raped by Rhaegar? I don't think those words ever passed his lips. So all this talk about Rhaegar is leading us somewhere. My only question is, is are, are we ever going to get a clear picture of that relationship this season, the next season, or the last season? Because we don't have much time left. But anyway, I digress. Littlefinger tells Sansa he's leaving her alone with the psychopath to go to King's Landing. And then he reveals his plan, or at least the plan he's telling to Sansa as opposed to the plan he was telling to Roose Bolton. Stannis is coming to clear the Bolton rats out of Winterfell and Stannis will make Sansa Wardeness of the North. Did you notice how Sansa didn't seem real confident about being Wardeness, like, I'm not sure I can do it? Yeah, you can, girl. Sure you can. And if Stannis doesn't win, Littlefinger's advice is to wrap Ramsay around her finger. I'm not comfortable with this plan. Are you comfortable with it? Speaking of discomfort, Littlefinger kisses her on the lips when he says goodbye. It's just, ugh, ugh, shake it off, shake it off, ugh. Somewhere off the coast of Dorne, Bronn is single-handedly rowing himself and Jamie to shore. A little while later, Jamie's sleeping and dawn breaks, and Bronn saves him from a poisonous snake, which turns around and becomes their breakfast of champions. And for a little light-hearted conversation during their breakfast, they talk about the ways that they would like to die. Ever the insightful Bronn asks Jamie, are you sure she wants the same thing? Jamie doesn't answer that because, well, facing the truth is just too hard for him right now and may always be too hard for him. And just when things were getting cozy, a random Dornish patrol happens by and we see some action. Jamie is definitely not ready for prime time and he almost gets killed, but ironically, he gets a hand from his hand and guess who gets stuck burying the bodies all by himself. Next, we finally, finally, finally get to see Oberyn's daughters, the Sand Snakes. And they appear to be in the middle of nowhere under some canopy with like this big stick stuck in the ground that's supposed to be an old tree but it's clearly just a big stick and the captain of the ship that brought Jamie over buried in the sand up to his neck. Laria arrives and says we have to get to Marcella before Jamie does. And then we get this really awkward soliloquy by Obara. I really wish they had just gone with one sand snake or they had introduced them. I would think it might have been better to introduce them somehow with talking to the captain in Planky Town. This whole scene with Ilaria here just doesn't work. So we go from the Dornish coast to yet another boat where we see Jorah steering it and Tyrion is being obnoxious even while gagged, trying to get Jorah's attention to have him remove said gag. So once Tyrion can talk, he quickly susses out that they're going east and boy is he relieved. Tyrion's mind can be a serious weapon. He figures out who Jorah is and his motives behind what he's doing. This of course irritates Jorah so that he backhands Tyrion into unconsciousness you think Tyrion would eventually learn to keep his mouth shut. On to Marine, where we get this beautiful aerial shot of the city. We find Danny and Sir Barristan discussing, who of all people, but Rhaegar again, about how he used to sing in the city and give the money to the poor. Again, Rhaegar doesn't sound like such a bad guy. This moment gets ruined by Dario, who arrives and says his dar is waiting to speak to the queen to once again bug her about reopening the pits. Danny releases Sir Barristan to do whatever he wants to do. I guess it's his day off. And the scene switches to Danny in the audience chamber talking to his dar, or at least listening to his dar go on and on, blathering about how the fighting pits are the one thing that unite both the common people and the masters. He says all men must die, but they don't all get to die in glory. And if that doesn't clue you into something bad's about going to happen, I don't know what will. Now, just as his dar is finishing, we get cutaways to see the sons of the harpy running around through the city streets. We quickly see the sons of the harpy kill a few of Dario's men in a marketplace, which is meant to draw out the unsullied on patrol. The unsullied rush into the marketplace. The prostitute to help kill the unsullied from last week is there, and she points them to the their convenient ambush location. So the harpies flood into the room and the unsullied are outnumbered at least two to one. One of the 
Unsullied's still standing is Grey Worm, and he is kicking ass and taking names. But this isn't Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, folks. Game of Thrones has always kept the fight sequences pretty realistic. So it's no surprise, even after taking out quite a few harpies, that Grey Worm gets injured. He gets a stab wound on his right side. Note that the wound he took might be survivable if it missed his lung, and from the position that I could see, it just might have missed the lung. Then we see Sir Barristan walking through the city streets, and as soon as we saw the back of his head, I knew he was a goner. He hears the warning bells, and of course he runs towards the trouble. And then we see cutaway scenes of harpies attacking Unsullied all around the city. I think when the final tally comes in, we're going to see that hundreds of Unsullied have died, and that this was a city-wide coordinated attack. Because it's coordinated, someone has to be leading the harpies. I also think it's no coincidence that this is happening right when Hisdar is in front of Danny arguing for the reopening of the pits. I have something to say about this in the spoiler section. And just as Grey Worm is the only unsullied left standing and beginning to falter, Sir Barristan Badass enters a room and starts cleaving those masked mother effers. Didn't you just love how the heroic music just swelled when he started wailing on them? By my count, he took out 14 harpies before he was stabbed. Again, anyone saying that he didn't go out heroically enough just wasn't watching the same show that I was. Sir Barristan is not in his prime anymore. He's older. He didn't have any armor on. He was using a long sword in a knife fight, essentially. And he still managed to take out 14 of them. Can you imagine how good he must have been in his prime? In the end, Grey Worm collapses next to Sir Barristan, and there's just no way the knight can survive this. In a time and place where blood transfusions don't exist, that's just too much blood to survive. And then it ended. I turned to my husband and said, that's it? And that's it for me, except for the spoilers, which are coming up in a sec. For those who were fussing about how easily the Unsullied died, I don't think you and I were watching the same thing. The Unsullied are used to fighting in open spaces, in formation with their, with their spears. They're used to facing charges from the front, usually mounted charges. This is made very, very clear in the books. They never said in the books that they were great melee fighters or great close quarter fighters. George basically said that they stood their ground against mounted charges and never broke formation. That's a whole different ball game than what we're about to see here. This room that they're caught in is extremely narrow, so and there's a lot of people in it, so the use of spears and full, full use and range of motion, they don't have it. There are also multiple doors and directions that the Sons of the Harpy can come at them from. Again, they didn't get time to form a formation, and now they've got people coming at them from all sides. Also, there's the element of surprise. Every time in the past, the Harpies have killed and run and hid in the city. They've never stayed behind to stand up and fight. So the Unsullied think they're chasing one to ground, and really what's happening is they're running into an ambush. So the first spoiler, Mace is going to Bravos with Sir Marin Trant. We know from the Winds of Winter excerpts, chapter ex excerpts, that Arya is going to run into someone and kill them. And that was in the excerpt, Wrath the Sweetling. In any case, I think Raph is already dead in the show, so we know Trant is going over there, and we know he's on her list, so I'm guessing, and you're probably guessing too, that he's going to be the one that she runs into and kills. So her little three-person list is about to shrink to two. Excellent. Spoiler number two. Remember, Melisandre said that they had to bring Shireen to the wall, and that she had a role to play. In this episode, she is reminding Celise again of that fact. And she makes a point to comment about Shireen having royal blood. Now, it's pretty obvious that she plans to use Shireen for some kind of blood magic, either sacrificing her entirely or using some of her blood to do something. So I'm thinking she might sacrifice Shireen in some fashion in order to create a shadow baby or something to hurt the Boltons, or it might have something to do with John. If you read the books all the way through, you know that John is supposed to die very soon. And if Shireen is around, I could totally see Melisandre sacrificing Shireen in order to bring John back to life. I really hope this won't happen, but they've been telegraphing it for a while. I do think that one of the positive things that would come out of this is that Davos will finally break from Stannis and Stannis will lose his loyalty. And he should if that happens. Spoiler number three. In the books, we know John gets the pink letter that announces that Arya, or fake Arya, is going to marry Ramsay. Well, 
In this case, I think that the letter John sends to the Boltons asking for men will receive a response back from the Boltons that says, no, we don't have any men to spare. But hey, we're having a wedding. Sands is marrying Ramsey. Why don't you come join us as a guest? And that's going to take the place of the pink letter. John's going to be upset and want to go rescue her. He'll be torn between wanting to save Sansa or staying true to the Night's Watch. Spoiler number four. We know that Sir Bearston is alive in the books, but he's dead on the show. We know from the Winds of Winter excerpts that his dar is the one who's behind the harpies, and we know that Sir Bearston eventually kills him. So now who's going to kill his dar on the show? I think there's only two possibilities. I think it's going to be Dario or Jorah. Maybe it could be Grey Worm, but he has to recover in time. So I still think it's between Dario and Jorah. And Dario will only do that if he actually sticks around. Now you have to remember that Danny was prophesy to have three major portrayals, and she's still waiting for at least one or two more to happen. So Dario will do it if he sticks around, but if he doesn't, it'll have to be Jorah. And Jorah will have to be back in her good graces before that can occur. What do you all think? Who's going to end up killing his dar? 